Um, for those of you who are not familiar with me, I'm I, uh, Scott Hamilton, and I started a offshore, well, not just offshore, even I apparently forget that I do inshore also, but the weather uh, doesn't let me offshore as much as I would like, so I do inshore. Uh, but I started a fly fishing only guide service back in 1991, and they, uh, everybody that told me I was out of my mind back then is out of business, so I think it's a testimony <laughs> to stubbornness, actually, and not a whole lot else. Everybody, everybody, you know, thinks about offshore fly fishing, and the immediate impression is that you need a 35, 40 foot sport fishing boat, and a, and again, due to the environment, that's one of the really nice things. Is that it's such a short run. I regularly see flat skiffs out beyond the reef. Uh, I start looking for dolphin at the reef. With the exception of the fall where they can be 10 or 12 miles out, I almost never get farther than, than four or five miles looking for them. Uh, they're, they're usually in, in very close. How many people have caught dolphin on fly? That would be awesome. Um, do I, I don't to this day understand why dolphin gets so little press as a fly rod target because they're spectacular fly rod fish. And, and one notable reason, every fish out there that I can think of, sailfish, tarpon, tunas, mackerels, they all have a fighting style where the, the tarpon and the sailfish are going to jump, tail, walk, move around. The, uh, the mackerels tend to just blister away in a straight line. The, uh, the tunas and the false albacore tend to hit and go down and then bulldog you for every inch of line back to the boat. A dolphin is the only thing I know that has all the fighting styles. You, uh, you have just as much of a chance of having one head 200 feet straight down and getting on its side and bulldogging you for every inch as having one greyhound out of sight or get up and tail walk in a complete circle around the boat. Um, and I think that's uh, my main attraction to dolphin, dolphin, dolphin are hands down. If I had to pick just one out of the 30 or 40 different species that have fished for through the course of the year, it, it's not even a contest. It's a, uh, it'll be dolphin every time. What's the setup for a dolphin? Uh, size rod? Yes. Um, depending on the size dolphin, we've caught 10 pound dolphin on four weight rods. <laughs> Uh, there have been plenty of 20 pound to 30 pound dolphin that either I didn't and wish I did have a 12 weight on or needed every bit of the 12 weight on because they, they, can, be, they can be pretty brutal. Um, um, you're going you're gonna to be happy you got them on a bigger rod. Right. Now they'll, they'll eat you know, um, amazingly small food for, for a big fish. I've, br I've brought dolphin. Mm -hmm well over 40 pounds into the boat eating uh, dead glass minnows. Just the trail of dead glass minnows over the side and, and they'll come up the trail like Hansel and Gretel. Um, so they'll, they'll eat very small food and you can therefore throw fairly small rods at them. And they're a nice fish too in that, not unlike the tunas and the mackerels, they won't fight themselves completely into a state of exhaustion that they can't recover from. Mm -hmm. They will eventually give up, mm -hmm. uh, unlike the dolphin and the tuna. So when, when, when I have people fishing for uh, tunas, we always go up, you know, to the bigger size rods, mm -hmm. just uh, just to be a little considerate to the state of the fish at the end of the fight. But these are uh, th these are pretty as obviously super simple to tie. I mean, just and that is the barracuda fly. <coughs> So you're basically at this. That's that's the tip. Really? Uh, at least around Palm Beach, uh, the cooters are fairly spooky. Um, okay. How many people know about the condition of the coon population in Florida now? They've been decimated. There was a commercial market on them for a few years, and they just got hammered. Uh, and then uh, there is a uh, large contingent of people that fish for them on the weekends, and all they do is troll two lures around. So the population is, is down. They did just institute regulations on them. How many people knew that there's regulations on kudas now? They taste potently. I wonder why it was a commercial. You've never eaten one. 
Yeah. Have you ever eaten one? Yeah, that's why I say they taste horribly. Oh, it's the I meat disagree. Out there. That's <laughs> the, the <laughs> smallest. Yeah. The th ones under 30 inches? You must have had a bad fish or something. That's one of my wife's favorite eating fish. I mean, it's easily as good as any snapper and, and a whole lot easier to clean. The, the ones over 30 inches, you're running into a danger with the cigarettera. Um, everybody know about cigarettera poisoning? Yes. Um, but they, uh, the, the new regulations, I don't even know the regulations because I really don't kill them anymore. But they, uh, I think you're allowed to keep two and only one of them can be over 36 inches, I think. I think that's what the regulations See, 36 are. 36 or 38. Something like that. Um, so hopefully we're going to get them back because they are the most underrated fly rod game fish in Florida. Uh, amazingly fast, hard to fool with a fly, uh, jump like missiles, I mean, they're, they're everything you'd want um, in, a, uh, in an inshore fish. Mm -hmm. How much the guys ask you to keep one? Yeah. The, the, the way they figure out if it's good to eat, they throw it up on the dock, and if the flies don't land on it, they don't eat it. Yeah. I, I've never seen a fly yeah. not land on anything. <laughs> <laughs> this is how nuts it got when I was developing this fly. You go swimming with bait fish schools to see what they look like underwater. When you're swimming around a bait fish school, they look very. Uh, ghosty in the water. You cannot see much. The first thing you see when you see them in the water is the eye, the black pupil. The next thing that you see are the white mouth parts on a fish. Those are the most prominent things that you see when you're swimming around with a beige fish. So um, having a little bit of a, a white in front of the eyes, a cone shaped, kind of like that, I think is kind of, kind of important with this pattern. When you're fishing deep and, and targeting kings, with these. Describe your leader to me. Please. With water clarity offshore Palm Beach, I almost never run anything shorter than a nine foot leader. Okay. Uh, it's usually 10 to 12 on average. On the Kings, that should do fine. Um, you can try playing with leader length if you're not getting hits. The Kings are famous for turning on one minute and turning off the next minute. I mean, they're just, they're one of these weird fish that just have a schedule and they keep to it. You know, even the kingfish, commercial kingfish guys, you know, they'll talk about it on the radio. You'll hear them say they're on, they're off. <clears throat> but they, uh, if they're on at all, uh, 10 foot to 12 foot leader, uh, tapering down to, I like 20 pound, but that's because I'm grabbing leaders a lot and I like it a little bigger. Uh, if you get down much below 16 pound, um, if you don't have a brain, like I often don't have a brain and I don't put my gloves on and I'm just grabbing very taut, thin wire or thin leaders, I end up getting cut a lot. Um, and then they, uh, at the fly, I, I usually like single strand wire. It has a very small profile and the fish seem to have least objection to that than uh, like the rubber coated multi-strand stuff mm -hmm. is very easily seen. So uh, Albright knot for the, uh, the uh, wire to the leader connection and then you don't have to use a whole foot and you, sometimes if you can go down to eight inches or even six inches sometimes on the spanish mackerel i'm making a steel leader that's only three inches long mm -hmm. um, but if you if you're having trouble getting strikes with a longer you can try just shortening up the steel uh, and then a hay wire twisted to attach the fly at the at the wire and that's that's your basic wire rig be it kings or spanish or bluefish or uh, the, the spinner sharks have I've got a different method for. That does use multi-strand wire, but the uh, um, for everything else, that's your that's your even the wahoo, uh, even that, that's a, a typical wire rig. I love questions. Throw questions. Colors of eat these when when do you start really switching over to the olive and whites. Winter time. Uh, well, winter time, uh, uh, like Darren says, colors. I. Uh, I tend to find with a, a slightly dirtier water, stained water, or really dirty water, if we've had a, a lot of beach erosion, um, the, uh, the colors during the winter tend to be brighter. Um, chartreuse and white, yellow, uh, yellow and orange has been an extremely good color all winter. Uh, and as soon as the bait fish start showing up, the, the winds start calming down, the water starts getting clearer and clearer. Uh, that's where you start working over towards the, uh, the more natural colors, the, uh, the olives and white, all, all white. Um, 
in those probably between uh, the middle of May and the uh, end of October, this is the larger of the two. So this is a three aught hook. Um, I also tie it on a one aught hook. Um, I'll tie over a thousand of these easily each summer. It just it, you just go through them so fast. Between between fish breaking off and sharks and kudas eating the stuff that you're fighting, um, the olive and white hands down during the summer. As a, a but again, the exception being. <clears throat> when you get kings in the mix when you're live chum, um, the, the chartreuse and white is going to outfish the olive and white, hands down. So even in the summer, you would deep drop uh, a chartreuse and white rather than an olive and white if you think that the kings are available? Yes. The, uh, olive and white, for whatever reason, on the kings so does not work as well. There's just something about chartreuse that makes them crazy. The uh, the, the fishing that we've got coming up now, um, how many people fished offshore of much last summer? How many black fins did you catch? Okay, yeah. The last year was probably the, the best black fin tuna summer anybody I know can remember. I got tired of eating them. They were, it was ridiculous. Blue and black worked good last year too. Yellow fins like blue and black too. But how many yellow fins did you catch in Palm Beach County? One. <laughs> so we don't have to really worry about what the elephant's like. <laughs> across the if pond. You want across to go across the, the island, okay, we'll, 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 we'll venture into the uh, other country. Uh, you're right, blue and white. Um, and no, they, uh, blue and black. Blue and black. Um, the, uh, the colors that work best for me over there was a, uh, uh, that kind of a blue and a white and white. Uh, <coughs> made me fly in a three or four eye even a four odd with really big eyes. And right. they, uh, that was what the color of the yellow fins one. So the species we've got coming up, predominantly black fins, false albacore, dolphin, and they are the kings. Um, any questions specifically about any of those species that you'd like to like to hear about? What about cobia? Since it's cobia in our area are driven mostly by the cold weather. Right. Um, what, what colors do you throw out of do you? Uh, there is no color, there is a size. Uh, they will ignore something that big. Absolutely ignore it. Um, they will probably ignore something that big. They will start to pay attention to something that big. So big. That's the common denominator. I'll throw a sailfish streamer at them that's 12 inches long and have never had a refusal. Okay. Yeah, it's got to be big enough to get their attention. Okay. But this may be another species we don't have to worry about uh, because the, the, the best of it is driven by how cold it gets during our winters. Right. And we don't get cold winters anymore. So the pompano fishing has been abysmal. The cobia fishing's been almost non-existent. I think we had two days this year where a few people caught them. The other cobia fishing that you're gonna hear about uh, is trying to catch them off the backs of bull sharks in the Benita schools during the summer. Starting about five years ago, I knew no one, including myself, that ever lost a cobia to a bull shark. If you hooked one next to a bull shark, the bull shark would just keep on swimming and not pay any attention to what was going on. Five years ago, they went on the menu. And now it is really, really tough to get a cobia to the boat when you hook them near the bull sharks. And you may you may see plenty of cobias swimming around. We lost four 50-pound fish in about two hours, about what, through two, three summers ago. Uh, and I, I've just gotten to the point where I'm not even going to bother. I mean, it's just a waste of fish. You know, if you're going to feed the sharks, feed them some bonitas, you know, something that come in, you know, multiples of 10,000. And they, uh, the, the cobia is just so painful to see uh, a nice cobia get peeled off the end of your line. Um, so I'm, I'm refraining from doing the, the summertime cobia. Thing. I have a question about the cobia. You're right about the wolf sharks on the West Coast. We lost every single cobia to the sharks. Up in Destin? Uh, no, in Everglades City. Oh, okay. Yeah. But I have a question. I hooked two cobia uh, on a popper and pulled the hook on both of them. So I probably had a problem with this uh, strip set, if you can talk about that, specifically to cobia. Um, of one, one was on for three minutes and pulled the hook, and the other one just Hooked them and pulled them right away. Okay. First thing, uh, cobias 
80% of the diet, probably, minimum, 80% is crabs. Uh, I've cleaned out, I think I counted 65 crabs in the stomach of one one day. Um, so their main food is crabs. They'll eat everything, everything they can wrap their lips around. Um, I've seen, I've had them out offshore try to eat dolphin uh, next to the boat. Yeah. So there isn't anything they won't eat. But the inside of their mouth, because of that crab diet, is going to be like the bottom of a pair of old work boots. And hammering that hook in, you got to make sure that that hook is tarp and sharp. I mean, just scary sharp. Yeah. And hit them multiple times. That's why I lost the both, both fish. Yeah. The problem you're going to have with poppers, they have extremely strong jaws. When they clamp down on something, and this is a problem I have with the sailfish too, when they clamp down on a popper head, they'll hold on to that so tight the first couple of jabs that you're doing yeah. trying to set the hook, yeah. it's not moving at all. Um, you can you can try uh, sp spun beer fur heads collapse nicely yes. when a fish grabs them and you won't have that issue. Um, I can't say that I've ever thrown a popper at a, at a cobia because generally uh, they're down deep and they'll either fly down deep. Yeah, they came much out. better. They were all, all on top. Right. On top briefly. of the rake. Briefly. Uh, briefly, came, went down, came back up. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah mo mo most of your shots are going to be, you know, they'll show up at the boat and then they'll immediately be on their way down. So if you have a heavily weighted fly right at that moment, you know, hoping that they'll stay on the surface or bringing them in on a teaser plug, yeah. they'll stay on the surface a lot longer, yeah. or something like that. Um, but setting the hook in one, it may be one, depending on how fast you can read the situation, uh, if the fish is coming towards you at a great deal of speed, and you go like that, you don't get tight to him. Correct. If he's going away from you when he hits the fly, and you're doing a strip strike correctly, yeah. and all the slack's out of your line, and you go like that, you're going to pop the leader. Yeah. So I have huge issues with a strip strike right now, because all of the fish that I fish for are either running very fast towards you or away. And people pop fish off or, or just don't get the hooks at them correctly. So I, I like doing a combination. You strip and use the rod. That way, if he's going away from you and you come up, he's going to pull the rod tip back down. And you'll have that instant to know to let go of the line before it all go, you know, comes so tight and pops. Or if he's coming towards you, you're going to catch up three times the amount of just that is going to do, and you're more likely to come tight to him. The thing that I see people not do regularly, after you've got him hooked, he runs, he takes all your line, your line's cleared and the line's off the reel. With that, with the exception of everything, except soft, fat mouth fish like permit and bonefish, you got a nice rubbery mouth, everything else has got a hard mouth. There's nothing wrong with at that moment that the line comes tight and he's cleared and he's running. Don't touch the reel. Don't touch the line. Point the rod straight at the fish and give him a half a dozen more jabs and finish setting the hook. Almost invariably, if I get to that point, that fish is going to get to the boat. If I get a chance to do that, I almost, I mean, it's probably 99% of the fish will come back, end up coming back to the boat because he's thoroughly hooked. You know, you know, at times you think you got a good jab into them on the first, you know, the first set. You can't, you can't. And there's nothing wrong. Like I said, even with the soft mouth fish, they might be soft mouth, but it's rubber, rubbery and tough mouths and permanent in the bone fish. Um, obviously on the tarpon, you can't hit one too many times. It's, you know, uh, until you break the leader, more than merrier. Uh, uh, dolphin season is going to start right up. Uh, a friend of mine uh, caught 32 the other day on fly. So that's that's getting started. Anybody have any questions about the dolphin fishing? I do. On uh, When we're out trolling, <clears throat> we hook a fish, especially if there's floatsome around or something like that, and then from a dead boat, my other guys are spin fishermen, I grab the fly rod. Sometimes I notice that I'm getting refusals on the on the evening, whether it's olive or chartreuse or white. I'm wondering, and but there, if we we sabiki up some bar jacks off of that floatsome, we never get a refusal on the bar jack. Now I, I understand it's a live bait and everything, but the bar jack is brownish. Should do you ever tie any eat me's with a little bit of tan or brown? Oh yeah, on you, the back. This stuff to mimic is a, the bar jack. I generally don't because they uh, 
Um, most of the time when I'm going without chum, I have several other different methods. Uh, you see the bait switch teasing method yeah. for sailfish. You can do the same thing with the dolphin. So you can match your fly to the teaser. Um, or if you're working floatsome, uh, you can pull up and use a, a hookless plug. Um, actually, what's better on a dolphin is a, one of the rubber skirts with just a one ounce or a three quarter ounce lead in the head, no hook. Uh, because the dolphin will hit a plastic plug and turn right off. They'll hit that rubber thing multiple times and be fine with that. And then match your fly to whatever rubber skirt color you're using. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm rarely going out with, you know, trying to match those bar jacks. Now generally, in that situation, if I was stuck in that situation, I would go with a much completely different color and a completely different size and usually bigger fly. Uh, because those things are hard to catch. Those dolphins do not have an easy time catching those bar jacks, especially if there's debris and weed around. Those things are just lightning fast. So if you show them something that looks edible, bigger, slower, uh, that quite often will get you plenty of strikes. You have that school of 30 or 40 dolphin and there's that one big one. Yeah. You can use your fly as a teaser and tease that one fish out and away from the school and then pick them off. You can't cull a big dolphin out of a school of a, uh, other dolphin with any other equipment because you just, a piece of meat you have no control over. A plug you can't move fast enough. The, the, the fly you can either, you have two choices, either rip it away from one you don't want or you'll have that slack and if you end up with one you don't want, you just give him slack until he spits the fly out. So there's one one method you can throw you can just throw into the school if you've got the one that big one that's sulking he's not lit up throw it into the school let another one grab it you have enough slack to work with he runs it off spits it out strip it a few more times another one piles on it give him slack the more excited all those fish get that one that's sulking will most likely light up and come over and look and to see what's going on Trying that. Training yourself to set the hook when you do end up with the fish that you want is kind of a trick. So good luck with that one. Because <laughs> you'll be in mode. Problems, you'll, you'll, you'll be in mode. You know, getting you know, getting them, yeah. getting them off the hook, and then all of a sudden, the one you want streaks in and grabs it, and they uh, yeah, at that moment, you know, set the hook. The uh, the thing with the, with the school of dolphin around the boat, um, if you're not ready to hook one, don't put your fly in the water. Don't let it trail in the water. Don't, don't do anything with it until you're ready to hook them. You can educate a school of a dolphin in a matter of seconds. If you have one on and he spits it, you immediately need to get the fly moving to get another fish on. If you let the fly sit out there, one fish will come up and look at it, and if it's not moving right or if it's foul or if there's something wrong with that fly and that fish doesn't like it and he shies off, Every time he goes near that fly again, he's going to shy off. He's not even going to get a good look at it, and he's already going to be shying off. All his buddies see him shying off of this fly. Now they're shying off of it. And the edu you can see it happen in a matter of seconds where anywhere between 5 and 30 dolphin already know to get the jig is up. And at that point, either you have some chum to get him fired up with, or you drive away from that school because the, the, they're... They, <laughs> they may not look or act very smart, but they're, they're smarter than a lot of people get looked at it for. How far do you have to cast? For All the way to the fish. <laughs> <laughs> most, most, most dolphin strikes, if, you, if you're life chumming, are, are literally going to be right there. So oh, really? you're going to be, you're not even going to have lines stripped off. You don't need a bunch of lines stripped off. You don't want a bunch of lines stripped off. No. The more line you have stripped off, when one takes off at 35 miles an hour, mm -hmm. the more likely you're going to foul it out. Right. So don't have any more line than you need to work with. And a lot of my casting, you know, I'm slapping it in front of one and using the tip just a little. Don't get back like this, because then when you got a bite, you can't hook them. Mm -hmm. So it's slap it, move it, pick it up, slap it, move it, that kind of thing. Uh, when, they're, when they're in tight. And when they key on the boat, if you're throwing live chum, they're very, very quickly key on the boat. They don't, don't understand it. All they know is there's food falling out of that thing. And and it'll get to a point where you don't have to be throwing any chum. Uh, the dolphin, the tunas you can't. The dolphin you can feed to the point where they'll shut off. 
So be very light-handed chumming, or else you'll fill them up, and you can see that happen. Same as the education thing happened. You can see that they'll start moving slower. They won't be rushing over the food as fast. As soon as that starts happening, if they're still hanging around the boat, stop feeding them because they're, they're, they're filling up and they'll, they'll shut off. Um, but when they key on the boat, that's how close they're going to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're all going to be within 20 feet of the, of the boat. Um, so don't have more than 20 feet of line off, just enough to work with on the hook. But if you get into a hot dolphin bite, you don't need to fill the cooler. You can in a matter of minutes. I don't like my neighbors that much. I'm not going to bring them fish. <laughs> uh, so you go in barbless and, and being able to release, right. and a lot of fish will come off right. that way. Uh, but they, uh, there's nothing wrong with going barbless in that situation. Which charm is a particular one better than another one for dolphins? Or? There, that's a whole new, different spectrum of, a, uh, of fun you can have. Um, like I said, they'll come in on most anything. I mean, uh, I've had unbelievably big dolphin come in on glass minnows. I've had sailfish up on glass minnows multiple times. Just swimming around the boat, eating glass minnows like big purple and black brown trout, just sipping them off the surface. Uh, but the dolphin will come in on, on almost any size bait. Uh, in, in Palm Beach, now the, re the rest of the state has different bait fish schedules. But in Palm Beach, the, the glass minnows will show up first. And so you've got a fish that's generally no longer than about three inches long. Uh, and they, uh, <coughs> you're not going to really need a, 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 any flies bigger than that with the glass minnows because you'll be putting so many of them in the water that everything's going to be pretty well keyed on, on what you're throwing over the side and it's going to be made with glass minnows. Uh, the next thing that shows up are the sardines. Now, the sardines can be fun because when you go out and net them and put them in the live well, you're usually netting them in some fairly shallow water. And they're typically more comfortable down lower in the, if they're spooked. Mm -hmm. uh, if, they're, if they're feeding, they're going to be right up on the surface. But if they're spooked, they're going down deeper. So you take those fish and you put them in a live well. You take them out offshore into 150, 200 feet of water. You mark the school of fish underneath you. You can throw one single bait fish in the water and he's going to go because he's expecting it to be about 10 feet deep and he just hauls ass for the bottom and he runs into the fish and he goes and he hauls ass right back to the boat and here come all all the fish right on his uh -oh. and uh the the sardines will do that the um the threadfin herring sometimes will do that threadfin herring tend to be a uh, pretty fragile they're not a great bait fish to have for chum because you, there's a certain limit where you've got just the right amount in the live well. You put five more in the live well, and they all die. So they're very they're very touchy. Depending on the live well system you have, whether you've got enough flow. I've got one 1250 gallon an hour pump and another 800 gallon an hour pump on the live well, depending on what kind of bait fish I've got in there. And the uh, the threadfin herring, I haven't figured them out exactly how many. It's generally not as many as I would like for a day of chumming. Um, so they, they can be a little bit, but if that's all you've got access to, um, fish love to eat them. Um, and they, uh, the pilchards generally come in last, or what happens is, and it's becoming an issue, the big breeding pilchards will show up, and all the bait guys go crazy and net them all. Well, unfortunately, that was the brood stock for the rest of the summer's small ones. Mm -hmm. They come into the area, they lay their eggs, and about three weeks later, we start seeing tiny schools, enormous schools, tiny, tiny little big fish, pilchards. Mm -hmm. And they grow up, and then they will spawn at one point during the summer, and at the end of the summer, we'll have a whole new push of, of small uh, pilchards. And of, I don't know which one of those two groups, the secondary and the third, turn out to be the adults that hide somewhere over the winter and then show up in the spring as the brood stock to lay their eggs and start the whole cycle over again. Okay. So the bait fish situation has gotten bad where there, there are so many people looking for these bait fish that come the spring, you hope that these big breeding fish fly under everybody's radar and at least get a chance to spawn before they get completely a nut by now. Are they off the beaches? Or they're on they the beaches, they're in the inlet, they're back up in the estuaries, they're, they're, they're all over the place. Uh, yeah. So it's Catch-22. You have a lot of bait fish in the area, 
you're going to do better live chum uh, just because the fish aren't starving they've got plenty of food to their access when you make it easy for them they'll light up but during during the winter when the lack of food is there and a lot of these fish are just wintering over uh, good looking flies and you're good to go um, so that's the dolphin black fins uh, kings they, uh, and Albies are the are the main offshore targets for the rest of the summer. Uh, questions, specific questions yeah. about that? What do you do about separating the black fins from catching the black fins from the Albies? Is there anything you can do to help your chances with just black fins over the Albies? Go deeper. Mm -hmm. uh, the 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 Albies schools. It's not to say it's a it's written in, in stone it's not going to be written in stone but generally the albies are going to start to thin out about 200 feet and the and the, the black fins are perfectly happy out in three and even 400 feet of water so you're just saying try to divide the schools period that's one way yeah uh the uh after you get to know your environment for instance uh there's some deep water wrecks off of palm beach they're in 200 to 300 feet of water uh if you're going to get albies there they're going to be monster albies I mean, they're going to be 15 to 20 pound plus fish, uh, but that's where the black fins will tend to be more. Uh, you might have to wade through some some uh, false albacore first to get to the black fins, uh, or you may be catching them at the same time as the black fins. Um, <clears throat> those are probably the two easiest ways I know if you want to target specifically the black fins. Go deeper. Uh, and, and learn your environment to the point where you know where the black fins tend to be and the albies either aren't or aren't as many. And when you've chummed up, you know, the albies and you have a few black fins mixed in, besides, you know, being Picking able them to, out yeah, of the rampaging school of albies? Pick out, good luck. Is there, is there anything else you can do to help your chances? Yeah, um, you can, you can, the, Black fins predominantly won't pay any attention to the dead chum initially. If you get them lit up on live chum, they will sometimes then start to be happy eating dead chum. And then you can just start a trail right at the side of the boat. You throw two or three bait fish at a time and make a trail and those fish will follow it right up to the boat. And then like the dolphin, they'll key on the boat. They, you know, food's falling out of this thing. So we're gonna hang here. And then you'll start to see the species. And you'll start to see Benita, 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 Blackfin, Benita, 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 Blackfin, Benita, Blackfin, Blackfin. You know, you gotta kind of work out the time when your fly needs to be in the water. And, you know, they'll come up and eat a bait and they're very fast. If your fly hits the water, they may come right back up and, and get it. Um, you also have a very good chance of, you know, Blackfin, just ate the bait. Your fly hit the water, and here comes a 20 pound algae out from underneath the boat. But the timing thing's a tricky thing. It's really fun if you can pull it off, but that's a, uh, uh, that's a possible way of getting it done. Um, early in the season, before the, the algae's, uh, I caught eight blackfin the first week in March, which I went back over my records. So we've never caught that many blackfins in March before. Um, How do you? Actually, eight blackfins in one day in March. How do you? Uh, see, when you ask about blackfins, that's not going to help you. Any because I've caught them at 80 feet, I've caught them at 500 feet of water. And whereas the albies, if you're within 100 yards of the reef edge, you will catch albies. You know, there's there's no way around it. That's, that's where they like to be when they first show up. After they move in and force and they deplete the entire food supply, then they'll spread out mostly going towards the beach and ending up on inshore rock piles and inshore reefs, uh, some going out offshore. The black fins, 80 feet, never seen one inside 80 feet. Never. Uh, on out. And that's a daily thing. Uh, if you're going to go out and look for them, focus on current edges, weed lines in that depth range area, um, preferably beyond 150 feet because it is well this. You didn't know there's going to be a pop this. <laughs> because the albies will cover you up if you're inside of 150 feet. Uh, if you really want to focus on the black fins, look for some kind of feature, the debris, uh, 
not so much debris, but lines that they can feed down. The, the tunas are actually, if you look at it in a kind of a, a larger scope, act just like trout. They like to be on a piece of structure and they like to have their food brought to them by the current. And they'll just stay there. And just, they'll, they're just like birds in the water. They just keep flying around through, you know, you just, and they'll be very still. Now you're in a three knot current and you're, tro and you're drifting past them and they're like, wow, those fish are flying. They're not moving at all. They're staying in one place. Your boat's flying. So here's one of the key things. When you go back to fish that spot, give it a wide berth when you move back. You see all kinds of guys. Oh, we caught great fish there. Let's go back there. Right over the spot they just fished. Man, I guess they weren't there very long. You know, this, this is, a lot of this is not rocket science in any way. When I move back to a spot, I will give it a minimum of a hundred yard berth. Sometimes if the blackfins or skippies, and that's all they are, blackfins and skippies, I'll give them a half a mile to run way out and around and way, uh, half a mile in front of them. Is this where you start chumming? Uh, that would work for either chumming or if they're working down weed lines um, and you're, and if you watch, you'll see them working down weed lines and the birds will help you if the birds are on them. You know, they'll, the birds will be hovering over a patch of weed and then they'll move yeah. up current and over. You know, that's telling you exactly where the dolphin are. I mean, the, uh, the, the tunas are. And you basically stake out a nice big patch of weed full of bait fish. And you got a comfortable cast distance away from it and you wait for the fish to show up. Or actually how fast it happens, you start casting whether on the next bait, next patch of weed. Because they'll hit that. And if you wait to see them busting in that patch of weed, if there's not enough bait fish there, they'll hit it and be gone. So as soon as you see them throw at the uh, at the patch before the one you've got staked out, throw at it. And, and you can either just leave your fly there until you see some activity near the patch or immediately start working. It happens very fast. I uh, followed a school, not this summer, but last summer. I started off with a, uh, the breakers in Palm Beach. Um, in three and a half hours, we got to Boca and went chasing the school of tuna down the weed lines. There was one specific school of tuna. The birds were on them? Uh, yes and no. They, uh, initially, when we found them, the birds were not on them. Uh, and then we had birds come in on them, and they were moving so fast, the birds said, screw it, we'll go find a slow tuna. Yeah. And they kept on going, we kept on going with them. But they, uh, we, we were literally, we would have just enough time to run a half mile out in front of them, shut down and throw. And there they were, and then there they go. Yeah. If you can pull that off, I call that freestyling when you're, when you're throwing a tuna but they're breaking and you don't have chum, they call that freestyling. And if you get that done, that's a big feather in your cap. It's not an easy thing to do. It's extremely challenging, and a, uh, it's fun. Yeah.